whenever you sit in meditation, you have to think about that responsibility of being a meditator. Whenever you're here in an evening, on a Friday evening, listening to a teaching or a talk, you come in with a certain motivation, with a certain intention. And then there's this whole understanding that you have to have of the responsibility of actually being here, of being someone who spends that 7 to 9 p.m. time slot with some kind of a sacred philosophy, isn't it? Even if it is on your own when you are sitting in a meditation cushion and you do some kind of contemplation, doesn't matter which contemplation, you have to understand that it comes with saying, I am doing so and so. I am going to take on so and so. And so the whole question that you have to look into yourself all the time is, out of that, what is the fruition that is coming out of it? To myself, I would always say, 40 years of uh, Buddhist philosophy, what have I gained from that? As the fruition, what is it that I today have? Likewise, one would say, in a very much more tr smaller time frame, you could say, since I did two hours of meditation, what comes out of that? What should come out of that? If that examination, self-examination uh, on the result and what you are generating as fruition based upon the different methods that you apply in spirituality isn't being examined carefully, then aimlessness begins to happen. Aimlessness then always leads to what I think is the current difficulty that most spiritual faith, and now I'll stick only to Buddhism because that's where we are, so the Buddhist community's face today is lots of diligent students, but the required and the expected result not being there so much. And the common problem being is people become aimless. People lose track with their intention and their true motivation. Part reason seems to be is the immense amount of material that is there. Uh, spoken words by the teachers, the repetitions of this is the right motivation, this is what you should be doing, this is how, what you should be looking at, the number of Dharma books that are there, tapes and different forms of uh, media that are there. It influences the mind to assuming that your motivation is already correct or that your motivation is being kept intact. And we all know that the motivation has to be selfless compassion. So we assume that that is the motivation when we meditate. That is the motivation with which we come to a Dharma center. That is the motivation with which we follow teachers. That is the motivation with which we practice any contemplation. Is it really? You have to really look inside and take a very fresh examination within oneself to check one's intention and motivation. Only then can the actual fruition evolve from the path of practice that you are doing. And so over these last one or two years, what I've begun to uh, I spend some time uh, thinking about this because of having now sort of, uh, I think, 17, 18 years of um, being with um, Western students. I think um, in one aspect, on a positive note, I would say there's a lot of diligence. Easterners aren't as diligent as Western students are. That's one thing. That's very true. Uh, second very good thing about the Western meditators are that their uh, coming into meditation comes out of their own uh, intention, their own sort of willingness, their own experience of life. And so there's a much more mature uh, connection to the path of the practices. But the, these good qualities and several others often are dampened by one thing, is again, not really having an accurate understanding and balance between intention and result. So there's a little bit of a gap in between that. Intention often is very profound. Path of practice is paradox to the intention. And of course, that influences the result. But because of not being able to look carefully into this aspect, many times we find that when we speak with meditator, meditation, meditators or meditative students, meditation students, we find them always thinking, I am meditating to find, let's say, common results that you all aspire for is enlightenment, number one. Number two is genuine compassion so that you can benefit all sentient beings. And number three is just bodhisattva action, very kind actions, wisdom, 
kindness, love, being able to share and care and become a good person and so forth. That's the intention with which one begins. But in terms of the freeation, the method of meditation that you all apply often is a sense of, well, enlightenment, emptiness, freeation, everyone has, because you've read so many Dharma books, you've received so many teachings, so you all know the conclusion is going to be emptiness, enlightenment, luminosity and emptiness, nothing as it is, Dharma Dhatu, Dharma Kaya, and so on and so forth. So there is this hope that motivates you, and there is that end, the result, that you all know where you need to go to. And then the meditation, I won't say anything about it. Look at it on your own. You have to think. How much time do you spend with it? With what kind of attitude do you actually do it? And then how much of meditation are you able to take into post-meditation? Is your post-meditation, that is your daily life and all the activities, just a permeating quality of the meditation or is it in contrast? Is there no reflection of the meditation in post-meditation? Are they two opposites or do they look the same? And then there is an even pervasive quality that doesn't seem to be sort of um, abrasive to one another. And so when we begin to look at that, then we begin to find all problem areas. And the problem area, if it is all gathered into one, I would say, is not really understanding your own intention properly. And there's no harm because there's this mistaken belief that if you have a lesser intention or a weaker intention or a mundane intention, samsaric intention, worldly intention, common intention, basic intention, then that, that is almost seen as a negative thing. We always say, for example, Buddha taught lesser vehicle, media, higher vehicle, and then the secret vehicle, the secret mantrayana vehicle. And then there's always this ego play that we think, well, I won't be so optimistic as to go to the Mahayana, but Mahayana is the popular gap because Maha, the term means great, so it's a great vehicle. It's also that which teaches love and compassion, all those profound ideas. So there's this human psychological mind that begins to pick tricks to your own self where you think you're being humble in choosing a middle potential. By, but you, know, you really don't want to look at the lesser potential. So Hinayana is for monks and nuns, it's for the Theravadians, it's something that the Sri Lankans and then the Thailand and the Vietnamese do. This is something not, that we are afraid. So secret mantrayana, mostly you, know, you haven't gone to seminary if you're Shambhala because of that, that's sort of uh, stuck over there or it's considered to be a very high potential, maybe you're too quick. Some people have sneaked their way into going to different, <laughs> uh, you know, different avenues and quickly gotten into Vajrayana just to find out what this whole Vajra diamond indestructible completion path means. But Mahayana, if you look at it, there's this whole thing about greater vehicle. Even in teachings, it's very interesting whenever, I've done it myself, so I can't speak about others, but when you look at it, when you grow up, you think, uh, and you really, as a meditator, and for example, as you said, we receive teachings from all these remarkable bodhisattvas and great enlightened teachers. Living with them your entire life, you begin to think ego is not a problem, or at least not so, such a big problem. But even I remember when we received teachings, my own attitude often was the same thing. I don't know whether you all have that problem, but it, for me it is. It has always been is that you don't try to exaggerate by saying higher potential. That you don't attempt. I'm not of the highest potential. But there's definitely a reluctance towards the lesser potential. And you keep thinking, medium potential seems right, <laughs> isn't it? Maybe I am not, but I can be a medium potential. I don't have to get stuck at the lesser potential. Now, when you look at it in that way and you apply it to your own meditation, and again, whichever kind of contemplation that you do or meditation that you do, we begin to look inside and then find some sense of repulsion or a sort of revulsive, repulsiveness, repulsiveness, revulsion, or a kind of a rejection of the idea that it is bad to have mundane wishes if you are a spiritual practitioner, that you have to talk about selfless compassion. You have to talk about bodhicitta. You have to talk about enlightened activities of compassion. And your title here is also the relationship of enlightened bodhicitta with the four karmas or something like that, isn't it? Uh, and so if you look at it, what does it say? 
Whenever any center suggests a title of a program, for me, it's a fun time because it sort of, <laughs> I spoke about it. Now, this has been a big issue with the Berkeley Shambhala Center here about the title itself. But, you know, what, what is interesting is to always look back and see, because this really is a reflection of where we are as meditators, as practitioners. And so, when, however, because our own current potential We've never taken time to look into our own current potential. And on top of that, not having examined ourselves and our intentions properly, on top of that, we are reluctant to reveal the reality of our own hope and fear. And then we project and we fabricate our intention. We sort of imagine ourselves to be of a middling potential or a higher potential. In some cases, higher potential also. And so we keep thinking, my motivation in meditation is to be selflessly kind to the others. Untrue, most often times. That is not our intention. Sometimes we think meditation to attain knowledge and wisdom of the absolute truth. That is also not true. That's not our first priority at this time. We think enlightenment, shunyata, emptiness, peace, cessation. Also not true, most often times. These are byproducts. Often, if it happens, delightful. We'd be very happy. And there's a secret hope that accidentally we become selfless, compassionate. <laughs> we accidentally bump into enlightenment. Accidentally, everything ceases, and there is no longer any kind of duality. Those hope I don't argue with. So there is a secret hope, definitely. But the intention and hope are two different things. Intention in our meditation still is to have another day without problems. <laughs> yeah. Intention is to live a long life, not to be like your friend who suffered and got diagnosed with cancer. You immediately pray when you do tonglen for another person. You always say, may this person have healing uh, and a cure and be free from suffering. But there's always a secret wish. May I not ever uh, be in that person's shoes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Isn't it? And so financial problems, that may not happen. But as meditators, there is this force, like a peer pressure that young children in, have in schools, high schools and colleges, where they have this whole peer pressure. Likewise, communities have begun. And the whole influence of the growth of spirituality has begun to develop a very fabricated language which pressurizes people into then becoming sort of very good at hiding that intention within one's own self and we become a, sort of a bipolar disease begins to develop. There's this common sort of schizophrenic state where your own real intention and potentials have to be constantly suppressed instead of being true to that. That whole thing seems to be because lesser potential and having mundane hope and fear and then being a spiritual meditator to become free from that is almost seen like a negative thing. That's the bad thing to do. 